So I, I know Sue Falsoni from uh, the Perform Better Summit. She's been, um, God, she's been like a fixture with them for a long time. And uh, I mean, Sue, you pretty much, maybe I'm stand me if corrected, but um, you were the first female like athletic trainer to really like jump into pro sports. Like you, that's kind of like your whole, you know, shtick. Everyone they, they hear your your name, and you were like the one to kind of take that take that plunge, which is something to be proud of. Is this correct? Yeah, yeah. It. Um, I was uh, the first female head athletic trainer in pro sport when I uh, took that position with the Dodgers. So, yeah, it was a good time and a fun time. But you know, the the first person over the mountain is oftentimes the first person to get shot too. So it was a tough time. <laughs> oh, curious to hear you about know. that. Yeah. I, well, what do you mean, what do you, yeah, what do you mean by that? that up. So yeah, I mean, can you, can you explain like, <laughs> can you explain like, well, where some of the, like some of the ups and downs that you're talking about? You know, being in LA, it was a, a really big market and, um, you know, media is not always kind and certainly the comments I learned really quickly to not ever read the comments. Yeah. Um, you know, of a story. And so, you know, of course, anytime there was an injury, it was because I was a girl or, you know, anytime the team was losing, it was because they hired a girl and, you know, everything. I mean, I didn't know that my gender had that much power. To um, say, what, what a rational argument that yeah. is, you know, like, yeah. well, like, like, <laughs> like that, I don't, that is the worst argument ever to say that they're losing. I know, but I know there's assholes. I get it because we deal with it too. Um, but yeah, it just it, it sucks when you're you know trailblazing and then you got to deal with all that uh, stuff as well. When all you're trying to do is do the job you were hired to do and do it well. Yeah, you know it was tough. It was definitely uh, it was definitely tough, and um, you know being on the road was tough. But I loved working with the athletes. I loved working for the Dodgers. I mean, just an amazing organization, and um, the the athletes were amazing. I loved working with them, and um, so yeah, it was it was a it was a really really fun time. Um, but yeah, it was a tough time too. Baseball is just a tough gig in general for anybody. So the athletes, that they were, were they receptive to you or did they give pushback as well? No, they were very receptive. They were great. You know, clients, any client, right? It doesn't matter who they are. If you can help them, they don't care right. of what gender you are, what color you are, what color your hair is, what color your eyes are, right? Like you, they just want help, right? And when people are injured or they're in pain, and they, they want help and they're seeking understanding and they're seeking um, they're, they're seeking help. If you can help them um, and you can offer some type of a solution to help improve their quality of life, then then that's all they care about. And so the, the athletes were fantastic. They, they were really great, really respectful. They um, always included me in stuff. And, um, you know, this, so they always have like a, or they used to anyway, they would have like a rookie dress up night. <laughs> and so, you know, they... They told me they were like, "Okay, you just have to bring a pair of black heels," and I'm like, "I'm thinking, okay, like, what are they gonna have me dress up as? Right? This can go in any direction." So I show up in my black heels, and they, you know, everybody's dressed up. All the rookies were dressed up, and they uh, they had me dressed up in a cat suit, but they got me an extra large because they didn't want. They didn't want me to feel like I was being exploited or whatever. So they like got me this big extra large cat suit that just looked like a big garbage bag. Um, and this like nose and these ears, but it was really sweet that like, they took the time to think through that, right? They were like, okay, we want to include her, but we don't want to be jerks. So we're going to get an extra yeah. large cat yeah. suit. And so they were just were, my point is, is like they were super respectful and very inclusive for me for a lot of different things, which is great. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing because it's, it's still shocking to me that someone would ever turn around and say that, you know, oh, well, they, they're not winning because she's a girl. Or, you know, it, just, it doesn't make Some of the smartest people I know in the field, also Sue being one of them, you know, come on. I mean, I, I pay attention to smart people and right. people who are able to change, move the dial in the industry and who are able to make a difference. And when I'm meeting with a coach or if I'm meeting with, and let's say if I'm meeting with an educator, I, I'm, I'm like a sponge. Like I could sit within 30 seconds and know if this person has something to offer or not. And Sue, out of I mean, all the years I've been in the business, she's only had a great reputation. But you're a, you're a physical therapist by trade, right? I mean, your physical therapy yep. background. What's what's some of uh, you know uh, some of your other schooling? Yep. So physical therapy, athletic training, and strength coach. Strength coach. Um, and then technically, I've got my my 200 hour yoga instructor as well. So is, is there an air? Is there an area that you feel a little bit more um, passionate about? 
Um, yeah, I, you know, really, I like living on, well, I like living on the rehab side of performance, if that makes sense. Like people who are, um, you know, I, the, the post-op rehab stuff, I haven't done a lot of post-operative work in a while, but like guys who are kind of done with the rehab process and they're getting more into the performance aspect of stuff, but they're not quite ready to get back out on the field. That's really where I love to live. What are, can you, can you walk us through what, what that entails? So somebody comes out of um, surgery, I guess, and then they're cleared to begin this process. What is it that you do? Like, and I know it's going to vary, so I'm trying, trying to make it less broad, but maybe there are certain things that you do each time or certain things that you're looking for, uh, like some, some screening. For, I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to get an idea of what it is you go through with these, with these, with these people. Yeah. So when someone comes out of surgery, you know, the biggest thing is to know exactly what surgery was done, which I know sounds crazy, but um, all surgeries are not created equal. So if someone comes out and says that they've had a labral repair, you know, what does that mean? What type of sutures did the surgeon use? What type of repair tactic technique did they use? You know, you really want to understand exactly what was done and what tissues were involved. So that way you can apply normal physiological tissue healing type things. And then really it's just a matter of monitoring and, and managing pain and swelling and inflammation and all of those sorts of things. And then kind of moving through people, people through that rehab process and really supporting their physiology versus physiology is physiology, right? So our biggest thing is how can we support someone's physiology and move through the healing process as fast as we can? Um, pushing the envelopes in sports medicine, no doubt. Um, because, you know, one or two days makes a huge difference in the world of sports medicine. So we want to push that envelope of physiology without going over the edge um, and, you know, maintaining and, and regaining range of motion and sort of all that fundamental strength is obviously key right out of the gate. What are what are some of the things that you've really seen evolve in the strength and conditioning world with professional sports over the last? I mean, Sue, I mean, I'm not going to reveal I don't want to reveal your age here. <laughs> nor mine but uh, you've been doing you've been doing this a while just just like I have so over that last decade or so let's start there what what do you think has really evolved the most yeah i think people's concepts um of recovery i think are really uh, have really changed over the last decade or so you know it was used to be very very much about performance but you know let's face it i work with 18 to 35 year old healthy men who are at the top of their field, right? And who are the best athletes in what they do, you know, am I really going to make them jump that much higher or run that much faster? Like probably not, but if I, you know, maybe, maybe depending where they are, but if I can support their recovery process so they can come back again tomorrow and have an unbelievable workout or come back and, and have an unbelievable game or whatever, the, that the person who recovers is the person who's going to be healthy and who's going to, be the one left standing right holding the trophy so it's it's really about recovery i think a lot of the times and i think a lot of people are recognizing that as well well i, I think that's 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 a big problem i mean you when, when you look at an elite athlete in a sport and let's say i were i know rory McIlroy, i do not train him but you take someone who's world class in their sport and then you turn around as a strength coach and you come aboard and you're like, oh man, I've got an opportunity to work with this guy. He's number one. And his, you know, his average driving distance on tour is, you know, 305. And you start, but I can make it 312. And you start putting all these things in your head. But at what risk? Like, right. Sue, God forbid you ever work with, you know, a $300 million athlete a hundred million dollar athlete, a fifty million dollar athlete, and you put them in a jeopardizing spot where one you can injure them. But what she's saying is brilliant. I mean, it's about resiliency. Like, are you better off adding five uh, yards of distance to Rory's driver, or are you better off making sure that his tour season, which is ten months, he doesn't get sick, he recovers a hundred percent, he's you know he's feeling great from his flights, and he's changing time zones all the time. I mean, that's what you're saying. People are afraid to say that, though, Sue. So. You know, it's yeah, almost like devaluing I, yeah. the coach if they say that. <laughs> you know? Right, right. No, I totally get it. And, yeah, I always tell people, yeah, I'm not trying to be self-deprecating. I work with 18 to 35-year-old really healthy men. Like, mm -hmm. they should be getting better. They should be, you know, they're, they're at the top of their game. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to support that in every way possible, like you said. Their sleep patterns, 
strategies to combat time zone differences, all those things. Like, I think that's what makes great coaches great, right? It's not just about always about performance. There's so many other things that go into a great performance. In the bodybuilding community, which is something that, you know, you've been so you know dialed into with the magazine, I, I would love to see how many bodybuilders throughout the year, because their their whole thing, and I think the mistake that they make is they just keep the foot on the gas for too long. And, you know, every rep's a grind. And, you know, is it overtraining or is it underresting? And then out of nowhere, there's all this joint wear and tear. And every bodybuilder I ever meet, like, how's training? And they're like, I'm doing great, no injuries. I'm like, what the fuck are you bringing up no injuries for? I asked you, like, <laughs> like, like yeah. this is the first thing that you guys allude to. And it's just because they're wired to the point where it's like, put your foot on the gas and go, 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 go. And some are smarter than the others. But I'm curious to see if you start implementing some of that same approach. And a lot of them start backing off and allowing the body to heal and allow the nervous system to kind of recover and replenish. Are they going to get under bigger loads? Are they going to recover and rest more properly? Are they going to metabolize their food a lot better? Are they going to digest a lot better? And it's like, we're really yet to see a, a, someone in that market be able to dive in and, and kind of prove that. I think Ben Pakulski is trying to do that. Um, he's trying but he doesn't to, want to be looked at as a bodybuilder. Right, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't, look, I don't know what his branding is. <laughs> but I don't know what he's trying to do, but it does seem that he he is trying to take that approach. Like you don't have to just pound yourself into the ground and, and you know, every rep has to be to failure. You know, t- to Sue's point, it's like sleep has become almost like a buzzword now. Like, you know, before it was like a lot of people would be like, I'll sleep when I'm dead, like, which is horseshit. But now they're kind of realizing how important it is. And I, I don't know when that change hit. I'm, I, do you, can, maybe you guys can help me figure this out. I want to I get your opinion on it first, Sue. I just don't know. Yeah, when the change hit as far as like sleeping. Like sleep being cool. Yeah. It's always been important. It's always been important. But now it's like a buzzword yeah, where like, like, you know, where in, in the past it was all about sets and reps. And now everyone, you know, like, but let's face it, we're, we're bringing on Brandon Marcello now. We're talking to him about yeah. rest and recovery. And it's like suddenly everyone's like recovery, recovery, overtraining, undertraining. And there's all these different buzzwords. Yet this is stuff that's been, God, this has been going on as long as, as Forever, existence. Yeah. yeah. Right. Why yeah. We were talking about this. You know, 19, I was just saying, uh, gosh, 19 years ago at Athletes Performance, right? We were talking about all this stuff. It's been, this is not new stuff. I really don't know why it's kind of become this like new, new buzz thing, why everybody's so into it now. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Don? Um, I feel like it's probably within the last five to seven years. This is where the market of the wearables have really been coming into play. Um, that's, a good, that's a good point. You know, and, and I think there's just, there's just, uh, I mean, it's even like heart rate monitors have been around for years. And I'm convinced that 90% of the people wearing heart rate monitors, and this might be a low number. I'm sorry. Let's go with 99% of the people with heart rate monitors don't know what the hell they're using the heart rate monitor for. Like they're, they're, they're wearing an Apple watch and they're like, Oh, my heart rate's at 160. And I'm like, well, it's probably not. That's one. (laughs) And two, like, what are you measuring this for? Like, what is this, what is this measure? Like, what are you basing it off of? And they just have kind of a dumb look on the, on their face. So, you know, I think obviously like we all know that sleep's been good. Foolish look. Yes. Foolish, (laughs) foolish, not stupid. Sorry. Um, I think it's just, again, because of the wearable market, I think this has really kind of brought things into the mainstream market a little bit. Um, the thing I'm starting to look at is when you look at the general pop, the I would say the um, the avid, avid fitness goer, the individual who is reading Muscle and Fitness or Muscle and Fitness Hers or Men's Journal, someone who wants to get into better shape, you know, what are things that they're not, what, in your opinion, what are the because there's very easy, low-hanging fruit items that they're not diving in on. What are some of the things, in your opinion, that you're saying to yourself, oh, my God, this is so easy, yet no one is doing it? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think just from a general health standpoint, you know, and again, these are, these are not new things, things that we've been talking about. Like, sleep, obviously, is one of them. I think people really sort of, everybody's kind of talking about it now, which is good, but I, I think sleep, for my personal health has been a huge thing to get under control as well as nutrition, right? And what does nutrition mean to you, right? Everybody thinks like, oh, I don't go to um, McDonald's every day. So clearly I'm eating well, right? And that that's not necessarily the case. Like maybe, you know, everyone, like I've recently become vegetarian. I was like, oh, how great do you feel? I'm like, actually, I, I don't feel that different, right? Yeah. <laughs> Or if I eat vegan for a long time, people are like, oh, don't you feel 10 times better? I'm like, actually, no, I 
don't feel 10 times better, right? Yeah. Like, like where people have all of these misconceptions about what the buzzword for nutrition is for the day. And, um, you know, I think it's just different stuff for everybody. I don't think there's one right way to eat. She just dialed in on something that I've been talking about. I mean, obviously with Game Changers and with John Berardi coming on our show recently. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the focus goes on people who have not been um, living healthy lifestyles or, ha or consuming poor nutrition. So mm -hmm. if you have, like in that, I, and yes, did I watch that movie Game Changers? Yeah, I did. And I got crucified by several people for watching it because they're like, you're educated on this stuff. What do you need to go and watch a, docu a documentary for? You know why? Because I'm getting asked 10 times a day about it. And I said, well, let's see what, it, what they have to say. And let me be able to speak with some, with some evidence. But if you were eating Popeye's chicken twice a day and drinking you know, beers every day or eating candy and you're eating like shit. And then suddenly you go on a plant-based diet where you're consuming grains and plants. I'm assuming you're going to feel better, but right. <laughs> I would also assume that before you turn vegan or b b before you went plant strong or call what you want to call it, you're probably living a pretty healthy lifestyle. Sue, is that correct? Right. Okay, yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't feel th that much different when I became a vegetarian. Right. I mean, it, it, it was just a choice that I made and I stuck with it, but it wasn't like my life was like suddenly different or my skin was glowing or anything like that. Right. Like, uh, <laughs> it was the same shitty complexion that I have now. Um, but, <laughs> but I like your reasoning for doing it. I mean, Zach's reasoning for doing it wasn't, he's not sitting there saying, well, meat causes cancer or well, making claims that, you know, I think are a lot of them are horseshit. Zach's saying like, no, it's for, for me, it's inhumane it's and personal. I don't want to, it's yeah. personal. I don't want to kill animals. And I said, I just backed up. I said, all right, yeah. I understand. Right. It's one of those things there where there is no one right way. It's like, what, what feels good for you, right? And like, and the time-based eating for me, I feel like has been a really good thing. Like I do notice a difference with that. I mean, I think I've made some other just general adjustments, but you know, I feel like I am sleeping better with that. And I worry much less about what I'm eating during those hours than, than, um, than I used to, right? But I'm still vegetarian. Men still definitely. I, I like plant strong. That's yeah. a really great way to put it. I know. It. Look at you coming up with these terms. I yeah. know. I'm, I like that. I actually. Do too. What is um, it? What 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 has it? Fi uh, I don't want to say fixed. I'm sorry. What what do you feel it's improved? That you just said sleep. I feel like I'm sleeping better. I do feel like I'm sleeping better for sure. Because ever since <laughs> baseball, which has been, I mean, I've been out of the game now for six years, so it's been a long time. But I was definitely. I got into the same issues that the athletes get into, right? I was eating Ambien every night, drinking alcohol every night, right? Waking up, downing Red Bulls, downing ca caffeine, coffee to kind of get up all day, right? You get into this cycle. And I got to that point where I was not going to bed if I didn't have 10 milligrams of Ambien. And so to really get off that Ambien and to find some other um, natural, like people are like, oh, melatonin, I, I like, I, I would eat a ton of melatonin and it wouldn't necessarily yeah. help. So, um, Doesn't you know, it's, it, yeah. Right. It, it's just been a challenge. So I think that in the last probably five to six months, um, I, I feel like my sleep is getting under control and I feel like the, the time-based eating stuff has really made a, made a difference. I mean, that's really the only kind of major change because I've been vegetarian since March. So I feel like, or for, yeah, since March. So it's been the last few months that, that this has really, I think, helped. Do you, uh, did, did you have a problem breaking the, the ambient habit? Was that something that they had to wean you off or something that you had to, to, to adjust to? And was there any, yeah. like, any feeling of, I don't know, with, with, I know that people can experience withdrawals and it can be very uncomfortable. Was that your experience? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if it was phys physical or psychological, but I felt like if I didn't have an Ambien, like I wasn't going to bed, I was wide awake, right? So like it, it got down to the point where I was like, okay, I'll do five milligrams and then I'll do two and a half milligrams. And But even that two and a half milligrams, I felt like it was even mental. Like if I didn't take that, I wasn't going to bed and then I would just lay there wide awake. And so I, for me, I don't want to speak for other people, but it became a huge psychological dependence um, as well as most likely a physical dependence. And I know uh, time-based eating, that's something my wife started doing. And it's really, you know, she enjoys it too. It, it helps her comply with something. And she knows when she's going to eat, when she's not. So, like, the, the urges to, 
to venture outside of there kind of go away. So it makes it a little easier for, her. uh, I don't know if that's your experience, but it's also for me, I'm like, maybe I would try that. That's that, that is a, a, a meal plan that I would, I would give, give a shot to, especially since so many people seem to be, you know, giving it the thumbs up. You know who did it? I mean, I, I, I did it for a period of time, but I didn't do it consistently every day. I think it was something where once a week I would do, you know, uh, 16, 16 off, eight on type of thing. I mean, I mean, but Rob Yang, I mean, um, Rob Yang was the first one who introduced me to, I mean, you, you're calling it time-based eating. I mean, it's basically intermittent fasting, right? I mean, that's yeah, what intermittent, yeah, same yeah. Thing, yeah. So, um, I mean, Rob was the first one, I think, who introduced me to IF. God, I mean, Rob was probably doing this eight, nine years ago, maybe maybe 10 mm-hmm. years ago. And I remember he committed for about six months to it. And you know, Rob, when he commits to it, he commits. Right, and, right. And um, I, I did notice after a period of time, he did feel a little bit of a reduction in strength. But, you know, not everyone has those same fitness goals as Rob. And I don't know, maybe like, what is it doing for your brain function? Do you feel like a little bit more clarity? I mean, you said sleep already. I mean. Yeah, yeah, I do. I feel like I, um, I, I feel like brain clarity for sure. Not that you can tell, by the way, I just answered that question, but, um, (laughs) but but brain clarity for sure. I think my, my focus and attention is just better. And, and yeah, I think it just sort of removes that whole, right. Cause a lot of times, especially at night, what what do you do? You eat cause you're bored, right. Or you have a glass of wine cause you're bored and like, that's just off the table now. So it's, it's nice, right? Either I'm reading a book or I'm, I'm working. I definitely am more of a night worker. I, I, mornings are not good for me. I'll blame baseball for that as well. Hmm. So it takes me a while to get more going in the morning. Um, and then, you know, I'll work late into the evening. And so definitely just, it does better that way. And I think from a body comp, I, I feel like I've definitely seen a shift in my body comp as well. Uh, you know, not that I have a ton of weight to lose per se, but you know, I definitely wanted to kind of lean up a little bit and I definitely have seen a shift in body comp too. Why do you think a lot of these athletes are leaning towards sleeping pills? Do you think it's because of the of the time change? Do you think it's because of the stress? Is it all the above? I mean Yeah, I, I think like anything, right? Like we get done with work at midnight. And so let's say someone gets done with work at five o'clock. You don't walk in your door and go to bed. Right. right. Like that. You, you meet someone for a happy hour. Yeah, you, you go out for a drink. You decompress. You call, yeah. yeah. You decompress, right. You call your mom, you, you know, you call somebody or, you know, whatever you have this sort of post work ritual that you do. Well, when you end work at midnight, it's kind of the same thing, right? You're like, well, let's go out for a drink, except now you're having a drink at 1230 at night or one o'clock at night. And now you're eating dinner at one o'clock in the morning. And then you're, you know, it just, everything switches. So then you're going to bed at four or five in the morning and then you're sleeping till 11 o'clock or 12. And like the whole thing just sort of shifts. And it seems like a natural shift when you look at it from an hour standpoint, but really like eating a huge meal at 1 a.m. or, you know, drinking until 3 a.m. is really bad for your sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. So then you're like, oh gosh, we've got now all of a sudden we shift to from a night game to a day game. So then you go from, oh, I'm leaving the boat, the ballpark at midnight and I got to be back at nine o'clock in the morning. I got to get to sleep. I'm just going to pop a sleeping pill because I absolutely have to sleep, right? And so the option of getting two hours of sleep and then having to make sure you don't get hit in the head by a, by a fastball, it, it, that's just not an option, right? So you're like, oh, I'll just take a sleeping pill. Um, so I think it's a really easy cycle to get into. And like I said, I wasn't even playing and I got into that cycle. Okay. So we have, uh, the wheel and what we're going to do is this, it's real simple. There's a few things on there that we would, uh, we would kind of rush through or we would uh, explain to you, but some of them are really self-explanatory. Like if it's pet peeve, we just want to know your pet peeve. It could be in the profession. It could be about what other people are doing. It could be anything really, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's that simple. We're gonna, so we're going to spin it five times and it helps us learn more about you. And it definitely helps me learn more about Don. Um, I froze. We just had Randy Couture on and I, Zach asked me a question and I literally went, I went blank. I don't even know. What the, I still don't know what you were even asking. Oh, the five second rule. What does that mean? It means you got five seconds. No, I understand. Second, not rule. The five second game. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, but the question was something fast, fast as, or. Yeah. Oh, it was uh, things that are better, faster or something. 
Well, uh, now, 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 now my head's in a dirty spot. Here we I'm go. I'm going to hold the rod. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah, Don, stabilize. Keep a grip on that shaft, Don. Thank you. Ooh, and I love it. It has a whole Wheel of Fortune sound to it. Yes. Okay. What was I thinking? Oh, so Don's got this one since he's... God, I can't read. <laughs> he's got to put on his uh, Magoo spectacles. What was I thinking? Okay. Any workout diet trend that you regret taking part in? Oh, that's a great question. So I did um, 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 the whole, I don't even remember what it was called. The Whole30? No, it wasn't Whole30. It was, um, oh, the HCG diet. I did that. The H where you took Was it HCG? Is that what it was? Where you took the little pill and you ate like 500 calories a day? I don't know that one. I don't to know like that one. lose weight. It was to lose weight. It was a long time ago. But I think it was called the HCG diet. But yeah, you went to like a weight loss center, you huh. took a pill, and you only ate 500 calories a day for like two months. And you've never needed to lose weight. I've known you forever, and you've never needed so to how lose long, weight. So how long did you do exactly. that? So how long did you do that for before you I were... did it for months. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. She's like, I did it for five years. And it yeah, just, I know. She's like, I'm still doing it. This is actually like the 30th year, and it's still They told working. me it works it on an infomercial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, next one. Was there a specific job or client that you instantly regretted taking on or, or in one session like that, that you knew immediately that it, this was not going to be a fit? I do know one. I'm not going to say the name. But, yeah, I just knew right away that it was not going to be a fit. Guy or girl? Yeah. Uh, it was a guy. Hey, Alex yeah. Rodriguez? <laughs> I'm throwing him under the bus. I'm throwing him under the bus. I'm throwing him under the bus. He showed up. Not that I like hate the entourage thing. It's totally fine depending on how it goes down. But like, you know, walked in the door, had 10 people with them, and then just had like, there was always people all the time, always, no matter what we were doing. And it was just never just like, and then we just be real and not have yeah, people around. Yeah. Yeah, I knew basically it wasn't going to work. So awesome. <laughs> ba ba we won't get into too specifics, uh, but baseball player, football player, hockey like It was a football player. Football player. Oh. Yeah, which is rare. Yeah, which is rare. Because usually, yeah, you don't see that very often in, in football. So it was we'll rare. leave it at that the other day. Some, so recently, someone reached out to me. They got in contact with me, and they said that they were um, working on set with one of my clients. And I checked the name out, and the name checked out, and they mentioned all these people, and I called my client, and they all checked out. And, it, and the entire time, it, it ended up being a spoof. Was it Jack Black? I don't know who it was. No, was that your client? No, I can't mention the name. Oh. But I called my client. I go, is this person legit? He goes, oh, no, he's great, this and that. I mentioned it. So this, is, this all clears out. And they said, yeah, but the person literally, and I realized something was wrong. The woman was literally on like a call with me. Like She starts like, I'm like writing, taking notes down. I'm trying to find her somewhere else because it's not going to work out. She wanted me to travel. And then she starts like blowing me kisses and like doing all this stuff on the phone. And I'm like, this is a little odd. I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, like, wow. yeah there's something. No, odd. it's like some weird, really weird, weird freaking weird. people out there. That's weird Good that story. Ralph Macchio oh, would surround himself by that type I of people. Don't knock on my client. Okay. I wish sure. I trained Just him. trying to see who it was. Just trying to prod a little bit. What what fashion trend did you participate in that you regret? Ooh, that I regret. Um, fashion trend that I regret. You know, there was the whole leg warmer phase. <laughs> that was a long time ago. What's wrong with those? Well, I'm you know, <laughs> I'm wearing them now. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the leg warmer phase because I would have said fanny pack, except they're back now and I love them and I have three of them. They yeah. do make sense. How about you? You got one? Oh my God. Yeah. 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 You just made um, crop tops. You wore that? Oh yeah. <laughs> back in like early, back in early 2000, no one was wearing them. And I would like walk into a gym with like, oh, just slash cro crop top. I uh, wear a crop top. And you know what? It was like, me and a buddy of mine did that. We'd wear it in the gym and no one, it was so standard. We'd wear like bandanas and crop tops. And it was just, it was sick. And I, I, I gotta be honest, I want to bring it back. <laughs> I, think, I think you should. I think you should. Fuck it, I'm awesome. bringing it back. <laughs> I'm bringing it back. I don't give a shit. I just, what, and what I get really aggressive so sometimes I go really hot and it would actually show a little bit of <laughs> so nipple some on hip, yeah. But it wasn't straight across. It was always a little bit of a slash. Like oh flash my gosh. Your abs you always know, you had to be on point. Guy. I was always tan, <laughs> sleeveless. Perfect. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Right? Let's do it. Right. Oh, <laughs> it was just about five Can second rule. Five second rule. Okay, Don, this time we're both going to do this. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple. You're going to get that. So then you're going to pick one to give to Sue. Then I'm going to give you a card, and then you're going to give me a card. 
So we'll explain it. So essentially, Don's going to give you a prompt, and he's going to ask for three things, and you have five seconds to fill in those three things. Okay. Ready. You tell me when. Okay. Ready. Well, after, we'll say after, after you finish the question, then I'll give him. Okay. Places you, you would hide a hidden camera. Uh, bedroom. Um, Freak. Oop, I love it. Done. Done. That was uh, it. That's that all was, we needed. That was perfect. Oh, no. <laughs> that <was just> perfect. <laughs> you win. You win. You I, win. I wouldn't have. Uh, yeah. I, I would have like, said that. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll go. I'll On the headboard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> On the headboard. Sorry. All right. Ready? Yes. This is great. Go. Oh, man. This is going to be a tough one for you. What's well, for her, not me? No, I was good. Well, we got to go in a circle. Okay. I thought this time. Oh, I thought it was okay. And then you were going to give one to me. And I got you. I'd love to do it. <laughs> Name three celebrities who shouldn't be celebrities. <laughs> Steve Weatherford. Um, <laughs> leave it at that. All right, we got one. <laughs> this game is not easy. Let's Ready? Go. All right, go. Don, you got this. You got to hold the hold the go. shaft again. Ooh. Money. Look at that. That was a serious <laughs> spin. Okay. Early, early retirement. retirement. Okay. Early, what is it? Early, early retirement? So you are going to, we're going to give you a question, and you're going to choose what should be retired or sent away to pasture uh, out of the questions we ask. So name okay. one exercise that needs to be retired from the gym immediately or See, from an exercise. This is easy. There's like a thousand ab exercises. I, I'm thinking the one like where you stand and you hold the weight, like the one where you're standing and you're holding the weight. And oh, you're like doing oh, side, side bends. bends. Yeah. That's very yeah. good. I would say burpees. Yeah, you hate burpees. I hate burpees. Yeah, you're an anti burpee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I yeah. gotta do burpees though because burpees. Some, well, it's part of your. It's some part of the of events. You... I yeah. I mean, do I like doing burpees? No. Would I like to? And I'll just interview myself. Would I like to uh, retire them? Yes. That's but you do them because of Spartan, race. right? Right. right. I, I don't want to do them. Well, it's not your fault. Yeah, Joe DeSanta, Joe DeSanta created, you know, you know the the burpee curriculum. So you know. <laughs> when he comes in, I, well, yeah. Don, Don tell can, him. Next time, tell him, tell him I said replace the burpee with the shake weight. <laughs> I'll be better off. Could you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? I Joe, can. Actually, just tell him that. Fun. Tell him I said Don says you use the shake weight instead of the burpee. I think yeah. we got one more, right? Yeah, you have to go. All right, here we go. Take it to the bank. Okay. All right, last one. Gonna shaft me up. Thank you. Go. Spin it hard. <laughs> this is really taking a left turn. This one. Uh, okay, so let's let's find another one. We'll go with ah oh! Oscar speech. Give me you. Oscar speech. Okay. Oscar speech. Okay. So you have just been awarded this coaster, and it represents the best honor you can get in your field. Now, if you can explain to us what this honor is for. So what would you want to be given this a, a prestigious award for? And then give us a 15, 20 second speech. 15. 15 second speech. Uh, just uh, <laughs> of accepting this incredible, terrific coaster. It says, per terrific. It says perform better on it. We're all set. Yeah. We're okay. Not this. Ready? And is this a serious award or like a... No, it's like serious. A, I mean, we are in the midst of actually ordering a, f a fake trophy, but uh, it is yet to get here. So we are going to go with uh, Coaster. Well, you know. this is basically how creative can you get right now? And how can okay. you lose any embarrassment, shyness? Right. We'll give you this instead. We want this you is to a belt buckle. This is a belt buckle that I got from oh, uh, yeah. Iceland. Okay, I like the belt buckle. 15 seconds. You ready? All right, I'm Set, ready. Set, Go. Okay, I am so grateful for being bestowed the, the most amazing wine educator in the country. I would really um, like to thank everybody who got me here um, by learning all the different terroirs and the different types of wine. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, hold on. Uh, there's all your fans. They, that's, uh, that's good. A I wine, think it's perfect. A wine educator. <laughs> I, I, I loved it. Um, Sue Falsoni, where can where can all of our viewers find you right right now? Uh, you can find me on Instagram uh, at Sue Falsoni. Uh, yeah, at Sue Falsoni. You can find me. Our website is structureandfunction.net. 
for all of our education stuff. I love it. Uh, Sue's one of the more brilliant coaches in the industry, someone that I have the highest respect for. We had a lot of fun today. We didn't even scratch the surface with her knowledge, but I think if anyone is listening to this episode, please go on, you know, Google her, go to her Instagram, her, her social pages, and just study this woman. She is brilliant. Thanks, guys. At Z-Raz. At Don Saladino. Questions are... Reps at MuscleAndFitness.com. Episode number 5,000. We're having a blast. Everyone, we love you. Sue Falsoni, our girl. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, guys.